Okay, welcome everybody. Let's get started. We have a lot to do today. So I'm Karen Von Hippel, the director of VC, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today to this event, Navigating the Poly Crisis. That's the first time I heard that word. Great word. Um, climate change, energy, security, and instability. Uh, it's great to welcome you all for several reasons. First of all, we're very lucky to have the Minister of State for Energy, Security, Net Zero. Uh, here with us, Red Honorable Graham Stewart, MP, and I will introduce him in a minute. Um, but it's also great for us at RUCI because we have recently started a program on energy security uh, and climate, and we're very grateful to the European uh, Climate Foundation for funding this work. Unfortunately, the, the head of that uh, uh, Laurence Tubiana was unable to come. She had to cancel this morning. Uh, so I'm sorry she's not here, but we're very grateful for them for their support and helping us to kickstart our project. Dan Marks, who is right there in the audience, who you should all talk to at some point. Dan, can you raise your hand so we can see you? He is our lead research fellow in this program, and we are hoping to expand it going forward. Um, you'll hear from the minister about the UK National Security and Net Zero Project, which I assume will deal with a range of issues related to the war in Ukraine, uh, with the energy transition with China, uh, with, with many other important issues that we're all wrestling with around the world, really. And then we will have a panel of very distinguished speakers, and we're delighted to welcome uh, all of our panelists, including one of our trustees, right, Honorable Amber Red. So thank you for joining us, all, all of our speakers and our chair. Um, and they will really delve a bit deeper into some of the risks and the political challenges. Um, and I think the timing today is quite interesting too, which I think the minister will, will, will get into a bit. Uh, there has been an important government announcement. I won't steal. Um, I won't steal your thunder. Um, but so, just to give everybody an overview, we have 90 minutes together. We'll hear from the minister. He'll take some questions, and then unfortunately, he has to leave. And then we'll welcome our panel up onto the stage. And then after that, at around seven o'clock, we will have a, a reception just outside this room. Right, Dan. Yes. Okay, great. So let me just briefly introduce the minister and then I'll get out of the way. Um, the Right Honorable Graham Stewart was appointed Minister of State for Energy Security and Net Zero and the Department for Energy Security uh, and Net Zero on 7th of February 2023. It's a recent appointment. He was pre He's held several other ministerial positions. Um, Minister of State in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. He was Minister of State at the Foreign and Commonwealth, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, Minister for Investment at the Department for International Trade, and Minister for Exports at DIT. I think I got them all right. <laughs> um, elected Member of Parliament for Beverly and Holderness in 2005. So a lot of experience in the whole range of issues that we're going to discuss today. So please join me in welcoming the Minister to the platform. Well, thank you, Karen, and uh, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, and thank you to the Royal United Services Institute for inviting me to speak uh, to you all today. Now, knowing how serious this group is, that um, I, I, I know if, if Elon Musk uh, and colleagues are to be believed, this event could indeed be one of our last. Uh, an open letter signed by hundreds of Experts in AI warned of powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. And as in addition to the uh, jobs that Karen itemized as a former government whip, I know exactly what that feels like. Um, but it's not just AI that threatens us. Humanity is on thin ice. The ice is melting fast, and we don't have a moment to lose. And I think we all understand the phenomenon of finding ourselves on that ice. And these are the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations launch, launching the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report just last week. And his message to all of humanity is clear. Time is running out to protect our planet. We must do everything in our power to preserve our future. And the longer we wait, the harder it will be. Two years ago, the integrated review said that competition for energy, the consequences of climate change and changes in biodiversity will compound global 
instability. And this month's refresh reflects the pace at which all those trends have accelerated. The transition into a multipolar, fragmented and contested world has happened more quickly and definitively than anticipated. We're now in a period of heightened risk and volatility that's likely to last beyond the 2030s. So we will spend an extra £5 billion pounds on defence over the next two years, focusing on the priority areas of nuclear resilience and conventional stockpiles. We're also aiming to reach defence spending of 2.5% of GDP. These commitments will maintain our leading position in NATO and continue the modernization of our armed forces, which will be further strengthened as we learn the lessons from the war in Ukraine. Now, we saw the destabilizing effect of Putin's illegal and unprovoked um, invasion of Ukraine and the impact that it had on energy markets. And although uh, one angle, you'd have thought we might not be terribly affected because we have limited exposure directly to Russian oil and gas. We haven't been shielded from uh, an astronomical rise in prices. The government uh, rightly, I think, stepped in, paying around half of almost every family's uh, energy bills this winter and around uh, up to half of the wholesale energy costs for uh, uh, businesses too. And as global prices fall, uh, we will, fortunately for the Exchequer, be able to wind down direct support. But our priority is to continue to bring down energy bills. That's why we're investing a billion pounds in the new Great British Insulation Scheme, so more households can reduce their demand and keep more of their hard-earned money. It's the best form of energy there is, um, is the energy that you don't use in the first place because you become more efficient. We're leveraging £300 million pounds of private funding for heat pump installations so we can move away from fossil fuels as a heat source in our homes. And we're giving our electric vehicle charging infrastructure um, a boost, investing £1 billion pounds so we'll be able to change and charge our cars more easily and indeed change them. So when we do click the heating on or drive to the shops, we want the power flowing through the network to be clean, secure, and affordable. Now, uh, as has been said, it's just 50 days um, uh, since uh, uh, this new department was founded. Prior to that, for six months, I was effectively, uh, albeit reported to my Secretary of State, the sole energy minister. So it would be somewhat, I'm only about 35. I aged very fast um, in that time. Um, and it was a, uh, a, a, it was a vote of um, confidence uh, in my abilities that meant that the Prime Minister rightly decided he'd better form a whole Department of State because I made it look that difficult when I was doing it by myself. So uh, it's very good, given the priority that this needs, the complexity of the tasks within it, uh, that we have a dedicated uh, department. And it's why I was delighted to launch the Powering Up Britain strategy today in the House. Um, it marks a radical shift in our energy system towards cleaner, more affordable energy sources after decades uh, of importing expensive fossil fuels. Uh, Right now, we can see that domestic, homegrown, clean energy is, in fact, the cheapest energy as well as the most secure energy. Um, our blueprint will diversify, decarbonize, and domesticate the UK's energy supply. Now, one of the most exciting commitments is delivering and launching today Great British Nuclear. Uh, by 2050, a quarter uh, of UK's electricity may come from nuclear sources, up from around 15% today, but of course with um, quite a lot of nuclear capacity coming offline. And that uh, will include uh, innovative small modular reactors, and that will be the first job of GBN starting next month uh, to move to a rapid down selection of technologies for small modular reactors. We'll deliver uh, more renewable energy capacity from other sources. We currently have enough solar to power 4 million homes, but by 2035, we want to quintuple that capacity. We already have the largest, the second, third, and fourth largest um, offshore wind farms in the world, but by 2030, we want enough capacity to power every home in the UK. So moving from around 14 uh, gigawatts today to 50 gigawatts in just uh, six and uh, whatever it is, three quarter years time. This means that in some circumstances, we'll be producing more green energy than the grid needs. And I would say, have a look at a map of Europe. And in this transition, you, when you look at the renewable potential, the UK has a remarkable and unique assets. If we capture all of that, 
we can deliver tremendously competitive electricity supply, and we can then use that um, to produce uh, hydrogen. Uh, and by 2030, we'll be producing 10 gigawatts of hydrogen, enough to power a city the size of London. And at least half of that will be electrolytic uh, or green hydrogen produced using uh, surplus renewable energy, uh, vital in smoothing the peaks and troughs of energy supply and domestic demand and providing another form of, uh, of potential storage. All this means that the UK will have a completely decarbonized energy supply and, I hope, amongst the cheapest in Europe by 2035. But we also know we're going to need hydrocarbons. Um, and we need a uh, great to have members of RUSI um, playing their part in having a grown up conversation about this because people often talk as if there's a button that we could press that would immediately move to renewables tomorrow morning. It's just a sort of um, blind Tory government that doesn't press it. In fact, three quarters of our energy right now comes from fossil fuels, three quarters. And we're the most decarbonized G7 economy in the world. We are possibly the only country who's actually on alignment with net zero by 2050, and three quarters of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Under net zero in 2050, we're still going to be using a quarter of the gas we do today. So the argument we shouldn't have any more oil and gas licenses in a declining North Sea when we can produce that with ever higher production standards and much lower emissions than the gas we would import in a tanker from elsewhere seems to be environmentally an absolute Nonsense. And yet it's you know, almost the social license to do it has been closing. And it cannot make sense for us to be importing higher emitting gas from elsewhere when we are going to be burning our own anyway, when we lose all the fiscal benefits of that. And at the moment, producers are being taxed at 75 percent. So it's an enormous amount of money coming from oil and gas production um, in the UK, which is helping pay for the support we're giving families and business. Uh, and we're going to need that capability um, in order to deliver the transition. When you look at carbon capture, you look at the um, uh, and the hydrogen economy, who are we going to need to deliver this? It's going to be the oil and gas companies. So they're disconnecting and moving their balance sheet, their engineering capability out of the UK is bad for the environment. It's bad for jobs. It's bad for the economy. It makes no sense. And yet, somehow the argument has been allowed to flow that somehow having new licenses makes us climate hypocrites instead of the fact we've got a, an absolute route to net zero and producing domestic oil and gas to ever higher standards has got to be part of it. Um, we know, as I say, we're going to need those hydrocarbons. Um, the sector supports 120,000 British jobs, the oil and gas sector, adds £17 billion to the economy and will provide an estimated £50 billion of tax over the next six years. And as I say, as there is no button to press, the alternative to producing our own is importing it from elsewhere and paying billions or tens of billions to foreign powers, not all of whom are friendly. Um, our oil and gas industry is a vital tool in ensuring our energy security, and by turning to our own supply, we'll support our economy and eliminate the emissions associated with transporting billions of gallons across the oceans. But what are we going to do about heavy industry, which is another one of the hard to decarbonize sectors and other polluting sectors that a modern economy simply can't live without? Well, we have, as it happens, we're blessed not only with this remarkable uh, uh, renewables potential, but also with uh, one of the greatest CO2 storage potential uh, of any country in the world. And as it happens, if you look, the other country with major carbon storage capacity in Europe is Norway. Ours is rather closer to the industrial um, heartlands of Western Europe. Uh, the UK continental shelf can safely store 78 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, which my Secretary of State, Grant Shapps, loves to call 78 gigatons. Um, it's a very Grant Shapps type expression. Um, uh, equivalent to all UK CO2 emissions from 1750 to 2020. Uh, he also rather likes the idea that we've been, been uh, become wealthy taking the oil and gas out of the North Sea. And the idea we can then take those spaces and fill them up again with carbon coming from our, our, our European neighbours and charge them for the privilege. So we make even more money from that, even as we um, uh, capture uh, the renewables all around it is something which appeals both to him and me. That's why the Chancellor announced a £20 billion funding package at the spring budget. We'll still need steel, chemicals, cement and a host of other ingredients if we're going to have a healthy economy. Carbon capture is the lifeline to these industries. And without carbon capture, 
there will be no net zero. And although we're firmly on the right path to net zero, it's essential that we continue to lead the world to bring down emissions everywhere. We've played a leading role in climate and nature discussions at the UN, including as hosts, of course, of the COP26 summit in Glasgow. Under the UK's stewardship, during a global pandemic, COP26 brought together nearly 200 countries to forge the historic Glasgow Climate Pact. And my favourite stat, I think, is that before the summit, just 30% of global GDP was covered by net zero pledges. So there were some, um, some perhaps even in my party, who'd say, what are we doing this for? We're a passingly small share. The rest of the world isn't following. After our presidency and my colleague Alok Sharma's leadership, we moved from 30%, it's now 91% of global GDP covered by net zero pledges. So the demand signal from the rest of the world is there. Everyone basically now is accepting of the science, which is becoming harder and harder, harder to argue with. But we know that developing countries are on the front line in the fight against climate change. That's why Britain has committed to spend £11.6 billion on international climate finance, a doubling um, from financial years 2021 to 2025 to 26. And £1.5 billion of that uh, will be adaptation finance um, uh, for 2025. The International Climate Finance Strategy was published today, and it sets out how we will deliver on the UNFCCC's commitment to mobilise jointly $100 billion of climate, climate finance a year for developing countries. The money will be used to protect the world's most vulnerable communities, to prevent the worst impacts of climate change, and to prepare for the future that will almost certainly include more regular once-in-a-generation catastrophes. And at least three billion pounds will go to nature and biodiversity projects because we believe that nature-based solutions are the best solutions where they can be delivered. We're determined to keep 1.5 degrees alive to give mother nature a fighting chance. That's why the strategic framework for international climate and nature action, we also published today, about 1,000 pages altogether. Apologise for those of you who need to read all of it. Um, I can see Sam at the back. I expect to hear his report by Monday. Um, shows that what role the UK will play internationally in this critical decade to 2030, working with others. We believe that collaboration, even more than competition, will deliver a clean environment for everyone. So navigating the poly crisis, climate change, energy security and instability, a typically brilliant Rusi title, I have to say, is our generation's, uh, one of our generation's certainly biggest challenge. Uh, my scriptwriter says, I don't know whether AI is a bigger challenge or not. There are a lot of threats and Rusi is, of course, in a great position to assess them. But climate change is certainly right up there. We must stand tall and fight for our climate, our energy security, and our economic prosperity. And because of our unique conditions, I think we can deliver all those things. So we don't need to have a battle between the true believers and the skeptics. In truth, if we get it right, we bring everyone on board because the UK can lean in ahead of others, because exploit our unique assets and skills, and build a more prosperous country, even while we have cleaner air, and even while we, found, we create the foundations, the long-term export potential to the rest of the world. We really can win on every front if we lean in, and that's exactly what we're setting out today. The green economy could be worth up to a trillion pounds to British businesses, according to McKinsey, between now and the end of the decade. And the announcements today provide a package of policies and proposals to ensure that Britain will be able to capitalise on our first mover status and take full technological advantage of the global transition. With new innovation, new industries and new investment, we can seize the opportunity of net zero while protecting our planet for generations to come. So thank you very much for inviting me and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and indeed questions. So, hands up. Yes, sir. Hi, um, hi, Minister. Um, it's Adam Vaughan from the Times. I just wanted to ask, you said um, we're firmly on the right path to net zero. Your own officials published a document today showing that we're off track for the NDC for 2030 and the six carbon budget for 2037. That's your own officials. So what's the, how do you square that and how do you reassure the public and our readers 
Well, Adam, this will be this will be a first for you. You've entirely misrepresented uh, what was said. What we've set out today is that we are on track. We, of course, we're exceeding our carbon budgets um, uh, uh, to date, and uh, we have set out today ninety seven percent. Um, of what we'll require in our sixth carbon budget, which remember is 2033 to 2037. Um, and oh, no, Adam, but then again, technology does tend to advance. And if we set out, we, we're obliged under the Act to give a very high degree of certainty. But as we've done with previous uh, carbon budgets, we have given ourselves a very small. Um, headroom because we just know that there are new technologies coming through and it would be irrational to overcommit uh, in areas and in truth as well there are areas of policy development um, where you have to roll the pitch and yeah uh, setting out policies which we haven't yet done that for are more likely to lead to a backlash way before we need to have a conversation we can roll the pitch and it would make us less likely to reach it so we've hit every single one to date and we are going to hit our carbon budget six, and nobody is obliged to account for their NDC ahead of 2024 when it starts under the UNFCCC. We have just unilaterally put it out there because that's who we are. And we've shown that we've got about 92% uh, under current policies. But again, we are going to meet and indeed exceed that. And I'm absolutely confident of our ability uh, to do so. Um, and we don't make our obligations lightly. So I wouldn't let, I mean, the Labour Party, and I don't blame them, they try to have a go. I mean, if with their record, I would desperately try and change the, I, I wasn't blaming yeah. you for that. Sorry. I, I just, I was going to say, it's just, it's just what Ed Miliband led, lent on today. And I was just, um, it was, it was just, as I said to him today, I, 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 allegedly I was slightly aggressive, but I said, well, as it was, our electricity was just 7% renewables in 2010, and now it's about 50, and only 14% of homes were decently insulated in 2010, and now it's heading up towards about 50%. On both cases, we want to go a lot further faster, but I'd rather take lectures from people who had a history of delivery rather than people who just criticise all the time. Our history is of delivery, and if you talk to the you know, you talk to any of the people at the UN and ask them, well, which country is on, you know, which countries are online for, N, uh, for um, you know, net zero um, and 2050. I think they might tell you there aren't countries. There's a country and it's us. Yes, right at the back in the corner. Hi. Are you an interloper? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um. We are leading the public campaign for the local electricity bill. It's supported by 318 MPs, 126 of your Conservative colleagues. Uh, it, that you talk of to exploit our unique assets and skills. There's huge enthusiasm for community-owned and run renewable energy in this country. Huge enthusiasm, but they're really being blocked at the moment. The local electricity bill aims to unblock that. Will you please commit to supporting the bill? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, well, we all support community energy. We'd all love to have that happen and unleash um, from the ground up uh, efforts. Uh, the truth is one of the biggest challenges facing um, the country in this transition is to get the grid right. Um, we need, I think, six times more investment in the next seven years than we've done in the last 30. It's a huge um, uh, financial, uh, logistical, supply chain, and indeed political challenge. Um, there are many parts of the uh, of the grid and in the nation, which if we had an automatic right, that the cost of reinforcement of the system uh, to facilitate that would be far greater than uh, would be disproportionate. So I think there are real technical reasons why something which seems so benign and so so obvious a thing to support uh, ha isn't something we can instantly support. But we are working very, very hard, as I said, pretty much for me. That's why we have a minister for nuclear and networks now, because I think that network, getting the networks right, all this brilliant and interesting generation is for the birds if we can't get the, uh, the electrons from where they're generated to where they're needed. So getting that right and we will be in a much better position to make sure that the kind of groups and community energy, which you rightly champion, can be facilitated. But there are, it's not just us being blindly saying no for no reason. It's because there are genuine technical reasons for that. Yes, sir. Um, thanks so much. Uh, Pete Chalkley from the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. Um, Pete Chalkley from the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit. Um, I haven't managed to read um, all 1,000 or so pages yet. I'm Shame afraid. on you. Shame on me. Um, so just to put that out there to, to, to begin with. Um, energy efficiency. 
um, often gets missed out um, in, in these kind of com- conversations. And I think you said earlier something along the lines of it being sort of the first place you'd go to improve your energy security. Um, I just wonder whether you could expand. I know the government has its target of 50% reduction, I think, uh, or Correct. increase in energy efficiency by, by 2030. Um, without wishing to point too much of a finger, the efficiency rates of you know insulating homes haven't been terrific in the past um, couple of years. And actually, you know, it's probably had we gone a bit faster, we may have been saved a few billions in terms of the energy support package that was required. But I, I hear what you're saying about energy efficiency being really important to energy security. But how do we go faster on that? Particularly as a politician, Graham, you know, it, it's one of those things that kind of gets left behind. How how do we make this politically more interesting? Because it is, as you say, at, it's a sort of bedrock of energy efficiency, uh, energy security. Great, great question. Um, I said my favourite form of energy is the energy we don't use. I mean, it, the leaner we make it, we make the poor better insulated, we make business leaner, more pro- likely to be profitable, more likely to be based here, the more efficient our systems. But I agree. I mean, you know, I mean, the political point is that it was woeful in 2010. I mean, we had easily the leakiest homes in the whole of Europe, and just 14% property insulated with at 50. So it gets talked down too much. Sometimes we can do it. I can feel that frustration with our various schemes, not all of which have been total triumphs. But actually, it's been a pretty transformative um, move, but we need to go so much further. That's why we've set up an energy efficiency task force led by uh, my uh, co-led with my colleague, Lord Callanan, who leads on it in my department, alongside Alison Rose, the um, uh, CEO of NatWest. And I hope, I mean, I mean task force, schmask force, you can be skeptical about these things, but if it brings industry together and they move against, and hopefully they sunset themselves and they move against a pretty tight timeline to get those policies, and then we get more voices in the what is always a politically, you know, as you say, it's politics. We need to make it sexier in a way. We need to make it um, something which it feels like there's a real demand signal for. But um, it's a big area. And again, just to rehearse the government arguments, which where we've come from, where we are, plus we're spending six and a half billion in this parliament on it. And we've committed uh, alongside the announcement of the autumn statement that we were going to set this target of a 15 percent reduction in demand from buildings and industry by 2030, um, that there's another six billion for 2025 to 2028. So the last thing I do is claim that our record was perfect, but it's been pretty transformative so far. And I think with the Energy Efficiency Task Force, the focus the Prime Minister's giving it, the money that the Chancellor's backing it with, we can go further. But I'd, as you say, if we can create the conditions so that we do even more of that, then um, it means there are fewer people who are going to be in fuel poverty and will have lower bills and our energy security will be improved. It's a, it's a no-brainer when we get it right. Right, I better go to this side of the room. The lady right at the back. Thank you. Fiona Clader. I'm the former regional ambassador for Latin America and Caribbean for COP26, now in the private sector. Um, you've highlighted the urgency of this agenda um, and to deliver this global transition, uh, mining is going to be absolutely crucial and not just critical minerals, very good to see the critical minerals refresh strategy, but base metals also needed. Long lead times involved in mining increasing global competition for those resources. Could you say more about how we can form key strategic partnerships um, to ensure that we both uh, use our influence in the world and also uh, protect our own domestic interests? Well, very good question. I mean, we are working closely. So I mean, again, one of the benefits of having a dedicated department, it gives a um, a uh, little more more um, bandwidth. Um, so working closely with our European colleagues. So we're back in the North Seas Energy uh, Cooperation Forum uh, and sort of local coordination. We're working closely uh, with the U- US and other allies um, to make sure that we collaborate rather than just compete and try and make sure that we don't have people wanting to move in the green direction and they end up putting up trade barriers, it'll slow what we do down and made us more dependent on certain people we don't want to be overly dependent on. But uh, so you're absolutely right. Of course, we've got a critical mineral strategy, but as people have pointed out, sometimes you have things which are uh, uh, don't get included in that, which are still critical to delivery. And we've got to make sure we entirely grasp the, the total uh, level of fragility in our supply chains. And we don't just seek a national solution. We look to deliver one alongside allies. Thank you. 
Um, next lady at the front here. Hi, Emma Gatton from The Telegraph. And um, do we not need a lot more onshore wind in England to make this work? It didn't get much mention in the documents today. And alongside onshore wind, do we not need other onshore infrastructure, We're talking pylons, cables, substations, in order to get electricity where we need it to be? Uh, yep, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd say yes to both of those. Um, onshore wind, uh, we're determined not to have it imposed. I used to see it in my constituency where it was being imposed by a distant inspectorate. I used to say the developers stopped trying to get a quick no and go into the inspector. And they said, well, why? We just, you know, it's government policy. We we get our wind farm. I said, well, in a democracy, it'll find a backlash. So what we've, we're determined to do is make sure we listen to and go with the grain of communities and find the right way to do that, which is why we're committed to working on community-supported onshore wind. Um, I want to see us be able to deliver that in a way um, that... Uh, doesn't scare the horses and um, comes with uh, avoids a political backlash. But I'd like to see more on that. And you're absolutely right. Going on, uh, if you take East Anglia, the real issues there and concerns around the impact of offshore wind farms, the pylons, the onshore infrastructure, the substations. And so what we've been doing, working very hard on that. Um, uh, and in other parts of the country is to have what we call a holistic network design, uh, HND, to try and look at how we coordinate across projects. It used to be just a sort of linear permissioning thing. And now, given the scale of what we need to do, we need to make sure we have greater coordination, we have a greater spatial strategy informing it, and we then work with communities to minimise any impact. And that's where cooperation with the uh, our European neighbours can help if it means that you know, we share um, electricity from a farm um, in different directions. We can cut down on the infrastructure that's needed on shore. Um, and uh, we are consulting on community benefits so that where we cannot entirely mitigate, which we won't be able to, we're going to need pylons. And we do have a presumption on pylons rather than sinking it underground because it's five to 10 times more expensive. It's also enormously disruptive. It's not some easy alternative either. And offshore has, you can't entirely do an offshore main, although we look at that as well. So all those areas um, need attention. And uh, we're, as I say, it's yes, yes to both. Yes, sir, in the middle. Okay, I haven't read the report today, and I will do. Um, but from the point of view of um uh, so electri electrification. Um, we we hear a lot about nuclear. We talk about wind. You've got solar. All these things. What about the decarbonisation of heat? Because um, you know we've specifically in an island. We have a, a great um, oil and gas background, obviously historically, and you know we have thermal energy under the ground everywhere. Uh, we started talking personally to Kieran Mullins and other parts of the government a few years ago. Geothermal came on the agenda. It was mentioned in the strategy report probably about a year ago in March this time, yet there was nothing brought around about the subject matter of uh, the thermal energy under the ground and the use of that in decarbonisation of heat, which seems to be really a big part when, if we're looking at strain on the grid, to put more energy to the grid with all these other things is going to be even more of a problem going forward. Good question. Uh, I mean, our ge our geology does not lend itself to geothermal to quite the same extent that other nations in Europe are blessed with, although Cornwall does have um, real prospects there. So we are open to that. Um, and Kieran never ceases to um, uh, uh, raise the issue. And in fact, he managed to grab both me and the Secretary of State together uh, only this week uh, as we and has, been, uh, has sent a report through to the two of us, which I'm looking forward to look at over the um, recess. So um, geothermal has a role, as does indeed tidal. We're world leaders in tidal energy, and uh, we've ring-fenced as part of the uh, fifth allocation round of contracts for difference. So it's the fifth auction we've run since the first in 2015. Um, today, we have a ring-fenced budget for um, tidal as well. So a whole um, raft of energies. And it's a bit like that Oscar-winning, the Oscar-winning triumphant film. We need everything everywhere all the time. I forget what it's called. But anyway, that's pretty much what we need. And we don't want to miss out on anything that can deliver for us economically. And as you say, uh, given the large-scale electrification, if we can find ways of balancing and minimising the amount we need, all to the good. Yep, last question. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> What is, what is the audience? Does the audience think we should reward the person who's pushing? It's an agriculture. It's agriculture. <laughs> I'm, I'm the director of Poop UK Limited. Poop. Because we're looking at. You're sure this isn't going to be a question? Um, sorry. Agriculture, everyone, 
kind of forgets that we've got 280 million tons of poo and 200 billion liters of tea. And we're looking at collecting, collecting all that. And you wouldn't believe it. Why we're collecting it all? And it's very doable. We've got plenty of animals everywhere. You'd be amazed how much they poo and pee. You wouldn't believe it. What we can raise, we can look at energy. In Texas, they really do it very well. We can actually extract all the methane, therefore no greenhouse emissions. And we can actually look at between 15 and 20 billion kilowatt hour of energy from poo that we waste right now. And it goes into lakes, rivers, and all that. So is there any way we've been looking at trying to look at getting this off the ground? Have you looked at, at the amount? I mean, we're looking at about 7 to 10% of, of UK's energy requirement. I know it's only poo. Sorry about that. No, yeah. put to good use. It sounds great. Um, I mean, we have a whole series of um, uh, measures which my department can, uh, uh, we can communicate with you and let you know in various innovation uh, funding pots and the like and processes precisely in order to allow the kind of nascent things. Because who, who knew that taking a wind turbine and sticking it in the inhospitable North Sea was going to drive the cost down? It wasn't obvious, was it? And a lot of people said it was madness and you'd never be able to do it. In fact, we went from 120 pounds a megawatt hour, the first auction in 2015, two auctions later in 2019, it was 39.50. So you never know whether it's in the inhospitable North Sea with a funny looking windmill or whether it's in um, animals poo. There may be a, a solution which we can be a world leader in and help us on the net zero pathway. Um, thank you very much for that uh, excellent um, uh, question. And thank you all very much indeed. Panel? No. We can take the statue. One of these is mine. Is that one here? The nearest, the nearest one to you. I don't think they've been touched, so you can choose. You can take your pick. I don't want the poo question. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, to the minister for his uh, remarks. Um, a lot to absorb uh, from that and, of course, from today's Powering Up Britain strategy that was announced uh, earlier today. We will, of course, touch upon many of these points through the discussion this evening. Um, I'd like to thank also the Director General, uh, Karen, for her comments and thoughts and for hosting this great debate uh, and, and, and wading into the energy and security space, which I think is vitally important. Uh, and thanks for inviting me uh, and the rest of the panel to have what promised to be a great discussion. My name's Al-Karim Govinji. Uh, I'm the Global Head of Public Affairs for DNV. DNV is a, a global uh, risk advisory assurance um, firm uh, that works uh, many sectors, including uh, across the whole energy value chain. Um, Please note, we do have an online audience today, as well as the physical audience sat before us today. So wanted to welcome you all here today. Um, before I get to the panel, though, I do want to offer a few uh, contextual remarks uh, about some of the discussions that we're going to have today. Um, the last three years, of course, have witnessed some, some fairly dramatic globally impacting uh, events uh, that have really catapulted energy to the top of the uh, geopolitical landscape. Uh, COVID, of course, has dampened uh, our economic activity. Ukraine, of course, has made us totally rethink uh, our energy dynamics. Um, and so the question is, how do we deal with that energy trilemma? Do we prioritize cost? Do we prioritize access? Or do we prioritize sustainability? All three, of course, are important, uh, but the deci decisions that um, governments have to make have become increasingly complex uh, due to a range of factors, including uh, the regulatory environments uh, that are around uh, in terms of supply chain constraints, in terms of market design, uh, et cetera. And so all of these, including things like cyber attacks, uh, physical attacks, um, are making the, the job for countries to um, move towards net zero that much more complicated. Uh, and so interestingly, the choice of partners, particularly, and that was touched upon by the minister, the international partnerships we have 
are proving to be ever more important. So within this context, how well is the UK positioned? Um, it appears to be focusing on making energy cheap, clean and British. Um, and the minister mentioned policies and investments today uh, through the various announcements, support for oil and gas, the 20 billion that was announced previously for CCUS, we saw announcements for the 160 million for floating offshore wind, the 240 million for hydrogen, some funding for heat pumps uh, and nuclear. So a range of different me measures, but is it enough? And is it focused on the right technologies? DNV's own forecast of the UK uh, says that we will not achieve net zero by 2050. In fact, we will reduce emissions by about 85%. Uh, so that's about 110 million tonnes uh, in 2050 versus the 400 million tonnes that we emitted in 2021. And we will also miss the 2030 targets uh, of 68% that is required. But we do believe it's affordable. So as a percentage of GDP, we believe that the 2% we invest in energy technology today will be half of that in 2050, given GDP growth. Uh, and the investment required to make us achieve net zero. And finally, what about the UK's position uh, in the context globally of the US, China, and the EU? The IPCC, of course, indicates that uh, emissions are rising globally. Um, and if emissions continue on the path that we're on from 2030 to 2050, then um, we will deplete the carbon budget to stay within 1.5 degrees. That's 500 gigatons. Um, and if urgent action is not taken by the time of the next IPCC report in 2027, then the window to avert catastrophic climate change may well have closed. So to get to our panel, um, firstly, Amber Rudd, uh, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change in 2015 and 16, trustee of the Climate Group, yep. um, chair of the International Advisor Group for the Norwegian energy company Equino, uh, along with several other positions, and of course, a Russi trustee. Welcome to you. Thank you. Next, we have James, Dr. James Henderson, Head of Gas Research at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, previously Russia and CIS Energy Specialist at Lambert Energy Advisory and Head of Research at Renaissance Capital. Welcome to you. Uh, and to round off the panel, we have Melissa Stark, uh, Managing Director and Global Lead for Renewables and Energy Transition Services at Accenture, member of the National Grid, ESO's Technology Advisory Council, and a fellow and chair of the Electricity Board in the UK Energy Institute. Big welcome to you all. Thank you. So let's get to some, some, some discussion. Um, the emphasis on energy security, at least in the short term, is impacting the energy mix of a number of different countries. And of course, each are taking different responses. Some are accelerating the oil and gas and coal uh, infrastructure. Others are moving to nuclear and accelerating those. Some are looking and maintaining their renewables plans. And of course, it's a bit of a mix of all of these in many countries. Uh, at the same time, of course, companies um, are also in the short term potentially reducing their net zero ambitions and trajectories, uh, given the international crisis that we face. So James, first to you, uh, if I may, how do you see the energy mix in the next couple of years, uh, particularly addressing it at the national level uh, and potentially Europe and, and other markets? Uh, so I think I'd, I'd answer that question by um, looking at sort of six impacts or six issues, if you like, um, that I think we've seen which have not just been a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the loss of Russian flows, but kind of exaggerated themes that were already inherent in energy markets. The first one's diversification. Clearly, um, searching for alternative sources of supply, particularly gas, has become a major priority um, for uh, particularly European countries, but actually around the world. Um, the initial response of many has been to turn to indigenous sources of supply, and for many countries, in Europe and particularly in Asia, that's been coal, which is obviously a negative impact on environmental issues. Um, and for many other countries, it's been looking for alternative sources of gas supply. And I guess um, one uh, kind of initial uh, reaction word of caution is we need to make be very clear that we're not going to kind of throw out of the frying pan into the fire so much. You know, we don't walk out of one problem with dependence on Russia and then walk into another 
we just need to be aware that you know the LNG market, which we're currently relying heavily on, is dominated by two or three big players, GATA, US, Australia, to name three. And we need to be careful that um, we are kind of cognizant of potential political reactions inside those countries. One example right now is the Australian government, which is currently considering um, the impact of uh, exports on domestic gas prices on the east coast of Australia and is potentially going to limit exports of LNG. So uh, we just need to be cognizant of that. Now, for, for the longer term, uh, many countries are looking at renewables as uh, a kind of both a greener uh, and indigenous source of energy supply, which obviously makes an awful lot of sense and is reflected in the minister's remarks today uh, for the UK. Again, without wanting to be negative about it, we clearly have to be cognizant of the supply chains involved in the renewable energy system. And I think you know many of those are, are well known in terms of the minerals and the processing, much of which is dominated by China at the moment. And of course, uh, many countries are looking to resolve that. So I think diversification is critical. I think the other interesting outcome from the, the loss of Russian gas was actually, it wasn't just a large amount of energy we lost. We lost a lot of flexibility in the system because actually Russian gas was the backstop for the global gas supply system. Um, essentially, if demand was up, we tended to see higher flows. If demand was down, they fell back. And that kind of balanced not only the European market, but actually the, the global gas market because LNG flowed as a result. And so Europe was kind of the, the market of last resort. Now we're a competitor. Now we're out there looking for, and to, to, to I noticed the, um, the minister's words, that it's become a more contested world. And that is certainly true in the short term, uh, where uh, Europe's search for LNG has created, um, well, clearly Russia is, is behind it all, but our search for LNG has clearly pushed prices up and has affected countries around the world, some of which can no longer afford for the gas. So it's been a whole world impact. And I think there's also... A, a whole energy system impact, because again, the impact of, of higher gas prices has been felt very much in electricity systems. And that has led to very high electricity prices and, and the need to think about how we manage security supply, not just in individual fuels, but actually across the system as a whole. Now, that's an issue that was already emerging before the war. I mean, um, you know, droughts in Europe had limited hydro, um, problems with nuclear in France had limited electricity production there and exports. And we've also seen over the last couple of years, periods of time where the wind hasn't blown and sadly, you know, the wind resource has not been there. And so already we were thinking about flexibility in the system and hydrocarbons as a backup and their role. And that's just really been exacerbated by um, the problems that have happened since the, since the Russians invaded Ukraine. On the flexibility point, my third word would be around storage. Um, storage has become a massive topic in the gas market. Um, we watch it consistently. In Europe, um, and thankfully, we have been very fortunate and had a, we've had a warm winter and gas storage levels are actually very high. So actually, we're in a quite a benign situation right now. In the UK, we've reconsidered our um, the use of the rough storage facility. So again, that's been a focus. I think looking further out, storage is going to be one of the critical things around security supply. I, I, I have read the document. I didn't see much mention of it, but battery technology and the development of batteries and other forms of storage is going to be absolutely critical if we're going to be not only using renewables, but having a secure energy system around them. Hydrogen, which we have, is mentioned a lot. There's definitely a role there. So I think storage is a critical issue. Um, prices uh, is, the, is the fourth. Clearly, I don't need to talk about the levels that prices went to last year. Um, but I think that connection between gas prices and electricity prices and the reaction of governments who needed to protect vulnerable customers and indeed in Europe at least, introduce price caps on wholesale markets, I think does raise some interesting questions about government intervention in markets, about the design of markets as well, about the links between things like gas and electricity and the model of marginal cost pricing, or whether there needs to be some adjustment of which there's much discussion. And indeed, I think it was on page 28 of the document that I read, there's actually mention of, a, of market design and the interaction between gas and electricity markets. So I think that's important. Linked to that is also the point about demand that the minister talked about. Consumption is absolutely critical here. And the question about consumption, I thought, was absolutely right. It's all very well dealing with the supply side. But if you only deal with the supply side, you just create the potential for more shocks in the system. Because if we don't ma manage the balance between investment in supply and demand, then we're going to run into all sorts of trouble. So insulating houses is one thing. 
I'm afraid also we do have to let prices do their work. We do have to allow the market, which has actually worked pretty well in terms of maintaining supply over the last 12 months, have the impact. And we saw a very good example of that in Spain, where the Spanish government essentially capped the price of gas going into the electricity system and demand for gas rose as demand everywhere else in the system was going down. So we just need to be mindful that we do have to accept the fact that in, on a short-term basis, albeit with protection for vulnerable customers, we do need to allow prices to do their work. And the final point I'd make is around timing. There is a timing issue here. We have a short-term issue, which I've described as a scrabble for alternative supply, and that's completely understandable over a sort of 12 to 24-month period. There's a long-term strategy, which I think the minister's laid out very well, and indeed the UK is one of many countries now with a kind of long-term renewable-based strategy indigenous supply, green supply. The problem is the bit in the middle, the transition itself, and how we manage security of supply and the need for hydrocarbons that the minister mentioned, and our, our, our willingness to invest in that medium term. Because we need to remember that security of supply for us is security of demand for other countries. And we have to find a way, and this is very, very clear in the gas market right now, where there is a debate going on between buyers in Europe and sellers in the US and other parts of the world about how long-term a contract people are prepared to sign. And historically, you'd always sign a sort of 20-year contract for an LNG project to allow the, the supplier to finance that via the banks and have some certainty of return over the 20 years. Now, 20 years seems an awful lot of time to sign up for gas, particularly if you're in Europe, because by... 2043, we're well into the transition. And you know there are big question marks about whether that gas will be used. So I think there's questions about that. And there's also questions about infrastructure and the building of LNG import terminals, the building of other gas infrastructure, and how you ensure that that is ready for the transition and it does not become a stranded asset. So I think these timing issues, particularly the medium term, you know, the kind of 10 to 15 year view is, is a really critical thing to get right in terms of making sure we're not just secure long term, but we're actually secure as we go through the transition. So I'll, I'll stop there, but obviously happy to discuss all those issues as we go through the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, James. And um, <clears throat> really interesting, your point about the diversification uh, and access to markets for, 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 for gas, particularly where it's plentiful in certain markets, uh, and some of those markets are constraining. Uh, the export of some of those products, and then, of course, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the growth in renewables needed to to then offset some of that, and that's the time required to do that. And also, of course, on the market pricing design, uh, where in Europe we've seen you know the $180 cap uh, on uh, gas prices to, uh, and to limit inframarginal producers making super profits as well. Um, Melissa, turning to you then, um, it'd be really great to get your thoughts, given that whole dynamic we discussed and in, in, in the energy mix. Um, what are the kind of companies doing uh, on their de decarbonization journeys? Are we seeing them in the short term uh, reducing their, their their ambitions? Yeah, no, no, not really. I think um, if you were a company and you had invested in renewables, particularly if you did a lot of self-generation, the, the folks that were very long renewables actually did better in this environment and they were not as exposed, right, to the natural yeah. gas prices. So, um, and then maybe to just throw some numbers out there, according to Bloomberg, um, investment in renewables and in grids and in electric mobility rose 31% in 2022, mm -hmm. right? So it went up by 31% in 2022. Um, also, what happened with the consumers, and I'm talking about the consumers of energy, the really big consumers, that investment was about 50-50 um, supply and demand. So that investment went into like consumers making investments, not just in the production side. And for the first time, we were darn close to parity with gas, oil, and fossil investment. It was like 0.9 or something. So this is fresh off the Bloomberg um, list. And, and I will tell you on the ground on projects, we're hearing a lot more around captive power, off-grid, microgrid, self-consumption, hybrid solutions, like really mixed up solutions for like mixed up in a really positive way. I mean, you know, I'm, I mean like, you know, hybrid with batteries and even solar and coal, solar, coal, and diesel, maximizing the solar, like very much trying to um, optimize around very creative and innovative new business models even shared infrastructure, 
So in Australia, I think Alinta, which is a utility, did a transmission line across three mines that had actually probably never spoken to each other. And all of a sudden they're sharing wind and solar and batteries, you know? So I think there's a shared infrastructure line as well. So we're seeing like real innovation in reaction to, I think what they saw, where you might've heard that there was some pullback um, or maybe a few of the companies that benefited from high prices, right? So then they will increase production. And if you increase production, maybe then you're gonna increase emissions. So your targets are maybe gonna be softened. However, that's not every oil company. So if I look at companies like Petronas, for example, which is a national oil company, that's why I like to quote them because they're a national oil company and you think that you know they would be protective, but they've, they're committing to 20% of their capital investment. So 20%, right? That's a big number considering how much is kind of run and maintain um, brownfield capex, 20% into renewables and energy efficiency. So yes, we've heard some headlines of some folks pulling back, but I would say that's definitely not everyone and that's definitely not the consumers of energy. Well, great to hear about these hybrid business models uh, and hybrid solutions um, to enable us to move forward. And um, I think it's encouraging to hear some of the actions that, that corporates are certainly taking uh, despite some of the challenges that we're seeing. Um, looking at the UK, last week, Andrew Lance led some chair of the Backbench Committee on Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, talked, uh, of course, about the criticality of the trilemma, which everyone acknowledges, but also the huge bottlenecks we're facing uh, around uh, raw materials, around supply chains, around market designs, uh, around grid investments. Um, one of the, 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 the issues that she mentioned and we touched upon earlier is the amount of grid that we are going to need uh, to electrify. Uh, and the amount of investment required from now until 2030 uh, will be of the order of seven times what we'd, we've invested in the last 30 years. So the scale of that need is is, is significant. Um, if we also look at offshore wind, you know, we've got 11 gigawatts today. Uh, the target is 50 gigawatts by 2030. We're doing about one gigawatt a year implies almost a fourfold increase on an annual basis for us to be able to reach our targets. So Amber, I mean, given today's announcements, given this challenge, um, do you feel the UK is doing enough to provide that policy certainty? Uh, is it supporting innovation enough? And is it in the right technologies? Thank you. Well, I think, I think first the good news, uh, which the minister quite reasonably was keen to tell us about, uh, which is because of the Climate Change Act of 2008, which I'm sure everybody knows was cross-party, public always say, why can't you all just work together? And at least on climate change and the Climate Change Act, we did. And he has to go to Parliament and describe how he's making the carbon budgets, which otherwise he can be taken to court for. So all that is, um, as one of the questioners asked, it's not, it's not quite 100 percent. But I think there is good news there that the government is held clearly to account, has to deliver, has to invest and has been you know, putting down some quite clear legislation to try and deliver that. That's great news. The, the more challenging news we also, he also touched on was the issue of the grid. And the grid is a harder machine to turn on when you want it. Um, I was at an event earlier in the week when it was pointed out that Germany had uh, commissioned and built five LNG terminals in a year. And yet, if you want to get a grid connection for a solar farm, there's one particularly that was quoted in Durham, uh, the grid connection has been offered in 2036. <laughs> so uh, to, 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 to Melissa's point about the infrastructure, the infrastructure required for renewables, it needs, the investment needs to carry on because it takes years to deliver. I mean, offshore wind, which used to take four to six years, is now taking eight to 12 years. So everything takes much longer to do um, than the hydrocarbons, which are much easier to switch the tap on and off a bit. Not quite that simple, but a bit of that. Um, the, the other point I'd just like to make is that when we think about the trilemma, which you referred to, which um, is the permanent challenge of any government, you know, ultimately you're trying to do those three things that you referred to, clean, cheap, British, we used to say security, but basically British, yes. Um, one of them is always going to be coming first. And for the past few years, particularly since Paris and Glasgow, it has felt to me like clean has been coming first, partly because we all thought there was a plethora of gas, that it was up to us, we could do it at the time we want. And I think that that has changed. 
Um, I mean, as as James will know, the price of gas was zooming through the top, really, were going up immensely, even before Russia invaded Ukraine. But after that happened, it became even more dramatic. And so security has taken over as the number one. So there's been much more perhaps tolerance of oil and gas, much more acknowledgement that we're going to have to work with it. Because one thing that politicians cannot ever put up with is blackouts, because the public, supportive though they are, rely on politicians to deliver the transition without blackouts. So we absolutely need the continued renewable investment. And I'm much encouraged by my Melissa's points, but we're not going to be, unless I would agree with the minister, dropping um, the, what we have at the moment too quickly so that there's going to be any sort of lacuna on the way. Mm. I mean, I think it's good to hear about the legal imperative to drive uh, us forward. Uh, you talked about the, the permit challenges, and I guess, you know, the EU, of course, have created these acceleration zones to try and fast track the investment in renewables in particular. It doesn't solve the grid problem, but at least you can deploy uh, offshore uh, within two years, onshore within uh, even faster and solar within three months in some cases uh, in these predetermined zones. May I, may I just make a comment on that? Because I, I don't think we got, I don't know whether anybody here has, has got to the bottom of it, but I'm not sure we got much improvement on the onshore wind position from today's documents. Is it still a requirement that you have to have everybody approving it in order to build it, which has been an effective ban? I don't know, but I think that's what he... Well, it was certainly mentioned. There wasn't that much. Is, that is, of course, the, the age-old problem of um, not just you know our public, his voter. You know, you have to take everybody with you in order to uh, make these changes. But it is much more popular than it used to be seven years ago, when <clears throat> former Secretary of State might have been in place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a follow-on question, Amber, uh, on on how the politics of energy across the UK uh, and elsewhere is changing. And I'm talking here about bilateral diplomacy. I'm talking about negotiations uh, with other countries. I'm talking about positioning uh, our energy situation with our citizens. How do you see that all changing from perhaps the time you were Secretary of State? Well, obviously, leaving the EU was a great mistake. Um, so because we did have a leadership role when we were part of the EU to try to put British interests at the heart of it. Um, but we are very connected with uh, Europe, with the EU and with, with the rest of Europe through our own interconnectors, and we work closely with them. So I would hope that there'll still be uh, ongoing close relationships and we all benefit from each other's um, achievements, really. I mean, the fact that Germany spent so much money on solar, we all get the benefit of that. So I think that there is a common advantage for the reducing costs of particularly renewables and a common goal in making sure that we have security. But if the, if the chips are down and there is a real challenge on security, each country will put their own country first, which is why it is important to make sure that we have our own resources um, well included as well. To the point on on the kind of interconnectivity and the, I mean, the UK was actually a land bridge for gas. I mean, because there wasn't enough infrastructure in Northwest Europe. There's masses of LNG import infrastructure in the UK. There was a there was actually a price differential between the two because we had so much gas in the UK and it was being transported across to Northwest Europe via the two interconnectors. So in in fact, you know, during the last twelve months, the the, the interconnectivity and particularly on gas has never been stronger. Yeah, good. Very good. Um, looking more perhaps internationally at the support other regions have provided on the green transition, uh, we saw the US, of course, last summer announcing its $369 billion through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the EU announced its Net Zero Industrial Act uh, just last week or the week before, uh, promising on the order of $250 billion. Um, and despite the large sums that the UK is promising through the packages today, um, uh, Chris Skidmore last week talked about the UK becoming a follower uh, rather than leader. Ed Miliband today um, chimed in and said, you know, there was no announcements today on the removal of onshore wind ban, um, no new investment for energy efficiency and no response to the IRA. Um, so, Melissa, how do you see the UK's position vis-a-vis -vis these other regions? Is it easy for UK companies to access funding, investment to make the necessary move towards the green energy that, that, that we talk about, create jobs, et cetera? 
I think it's when a company wants to invest in a market, it's more than just the funding. So I am going to wave the Team GB flag right now and name three things that I think the UK is doing that's unique and different and really important for the energy transition and to attract business and to create sustainable business. So first, um, over the last this last winter, we did 800 megawatts of demand response, megawatt hours, 800 megawatt hours of demand response. So that's incredibly significant. I think the world has talked about, could demand be equal to supply? How much demand flexibility do we have? 800 megawatt hours is like one to two CCGTs worth that we didn't have to turn on, right? Because demand kind of came together. And maybe if there was only, you know, one one pos- one thing that came out of the Russia-Ukraine war that, that was like a silver lining, it's the World War II like effort and awareness on demand. I mean, we heard it on the BBC all the time. I love that. And then we heard we, it was in the Metro in terms of tips to save your energy. So I think on the demand and and what that allowed, the fact that there was a demand flexibility service that was rolled out and there was that much participation, it meant companies like Octopus and Ovo and um, Podpoint could offer their consumers like managed charging and managed charging then helps the grid right? Because then it's, it's an aggregator model and it helps the grid. So there's all of these knock-on effects. And if you think about what had to be done for 800 megawatt hours to be delivered, there had to be National Grid ESO to have a product that had to be really tested very well. There had to be aggregators in the market that could actually had 30,000 EV customers to also participate. There had to be communications from the BBC and everybody else. So like, to deliver that, I don't I don't know if people realize how significant it is. It is, I think, the only example that proves that demand maybe could be equal to supply. Mm-hmm. And that's important because the more demand we use, the less supply we need. Right. So for those of you who follow the National Grid ESO annual scenarios, they do the future energy scenarios. The difference between the consumer transformation and the system transformation, both get to net zero, both good. It's about 25 percent of energy use 20 uses 25 percent less energy right in in that situation so you know demand to be um demand to be less wasteful demand to be more efficient and demand to be more flexible it, it can give us a lot right so that's like i think something really good and i use this uk example that just happened this last winter all the time the second thing that i think the uk is doing well which also is really good for business is the creation of the future system operator i love the idea that you're going to do an integrated view of gas, electricity, hydrogen, CCS, right? Because, you know, like the offshore wind, we used to do a transmission line for every farm. Offshore wind coordination project, I don't know what the end result of that project was in terms of exact numbers, but I know going into it, the estimate was 50% less projects, 25% less costs. Ultimately, I don't know if it hit that those metrics, but it was definitely less than would have been if it was like the spaghetti plan that was, which would have been the normal model, right? So, You know, there's going to be these really hard questions like the 50 gigawatts of offshore wind, which we know is more than we need. And then we have all this hydrogen. How do we decide that that's going to like, how do those two work together and reinforce our network? So now you have an FSO that's job is to actually look at the integrated infrastructures and how that works. Outside of the UK, where is that being done? China, five-year plan, five-year infrastructure plan. That's one country. Denmark, they're pretty good at that. You know, that's it, actually. Everybody else is trying to do this like integration of the different infrastructures with all these different other groups. So I think that's something really to watch. And then the third thing, which maybe is my favorite thing, is the industrial strategy. I love the industrial leveling leveling up strategy. I think UK was really the first with clusters. I know there's clusters around the world now. I know the US calls them hubs, but honestly, I think the UK was first. Um, uh, I, I think that in terms of presenting both both the way that the competition was done so that the community came together and bid together. I can proudly say that I've been on Humber Radio. You know, there's like a waterline summit, like the community comes together and the com- it's the community's project. So it's not just about decarbonizing, super important, but it's about like creating an area that's competitive in a net zero world and jobs along the way, right? And I think the UK has been very strong in that. And of course, You know, we launched um, this initiative with the World Economic Forum called Transitioning Industrial Clusters Towards Net Zero. There were four at COP26, and it was um, Zero Carbon Humber and High Net were two of the four. And then there was one uh, Bass Net Zero in Spain and then Quinana in Australia. Now there's 17, of course, quite a few U.S. ones, but the U.K. was really the first. 
And I think, I don't know how many times the UK is presented to how many countries, right? And they do it in this wonderful public-private model with like Will and Bryony presenting like the government side and then Humber and Hynet presenting the private side. And they do this really great public-private dance on like how we're going to do this together. So, so I would say it's just more than just cash, right? Because I think if we're going to transform the, our entire energy infrastructure and how we do it, we need like plumbing. Yeah. You can't just have money, right? You have to have plumbing. Like if there's no place to get water, like how do you build your house? So I think that's the thing that the UK has done very well is think about the plumbing and then really let the market. And I think it works for the UK because they love the market. Yeah. I think there's a lot of guilt with integrated planning. Like no one wants to talk, but it's like a good thing. But because the UK, the UK loves the free market, but they also kind of recognize the plumbing and it's a very tricky fine line, right? And so, um, so anyway, so I want to say it's more than money. And of course the UK should be on par with um, the, the US and the rest of Europe. But I think, you know, it is fine because it has all of those other things going for it as well. Very interesting nuance on 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 this. That it's not just about the funding. That we shouldn't just look at the headline numbers uh, that we see from the EU, uh, China, in fact, or or, or the US. Um, James, I mean, do you have some thoughts on on this from the kind of gas side? Um, perhaps looking at CCUS and decarbonisation. Yeah, look, I think. Um... I completely agree with Melissa that, that, that the UK has got um, a lot of things going for it. It's thought about a lot of the issues uh, and is one of the, has been the, in the forefront of thinking about the issues. Um, I think the only thing I respond, and I think it has some competitive advantages that the minister's raised already. I mean, wind, we have a lot of wind that we're geographically positioned for, you know, to take advantage of that. And we do have offshore fields where we can store carbon dioxide. So we can do CCUS. The only caveat I would say is that it's fine being a first mover but you've then got to follow through aggressively. And that's where money talks, unfortunately. And you've only got to see the reaction in the US to the IRA and what that has triggered in six months. And that tells you all you need to know about the way industry will move. Now, it won't, it won't be able to, they'll need to think about all the integration issues that Melissa's talked about. And, but basically, when you've got big companies with lots of cash being incentivized to take action, they do. And that's what we need to make sure that we get, we, we, we're not full of great ideas, yeah. which we're teaching the world. It doesn't take long for them to catch up pretty rapidly. And I know it's, it's not a particularly good analogy, but you only have to look at the way that Germany led the world in solar panels and now is, is pretty much nowhere in manufacturing to know that, you know, having been a first mover is good, but you've really got to follow through. And I think that's the only caveat would be, you know, if we do start a um, a kind of subsidy war mm. or, or a, a subsidy a race a, yeah. a subsidy race, we've got to, we've kind of got to be in the race. But I think yeah. the, the only way to do, to do that is to try to focus on the areas that we're good at. I yeah. agree with that because yeah. we can't possibly with compete yeah. with Uncle Sam's big purse. Yeah. And it, but the the scale of the era which you referred to in your comments reminds us that it is a foreign policy issue as much as an energy policy issue. No, it is absolutely. It is. I uh, was one of the questions I had for the minister was how he, you know, how he reacts reacts to that because it is a foreign policy issue. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. And of course, there's been there've been lots of discussions with the US uh, from various um, European yeah. prime ministers to try and get dispensation for European companies to participate in the IRA. Uh, and we've of course seen many companies make huge investments from Europe. Uh, and I think the concern for European businesses to stay within Europe uh, continues. Um, Internationally, then, I mean, governments increasingly fear uh, weaponization, shall we say, uh, and disruption of global supply chains and trade, including, of course, critical materials and dependencies. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's an appetite to have economic and, and green technological supremacy. Um, Amber, what should be the objectives for the UK as it navigates this space uh, as a country outside of those major blocks? Well, I think it has to play to its strengths. And we, we've talked, the minister talked a bit about some of the areas that we are strong at in terms of carbon capture and storage. And it was great to hear from Lissa about the clusters. Um, I think on critical minerals, we, we could be doing more to convene, to be honest, to try and coordinate about having some, not just uh, European or US, perhaps some Western leadership around this. And I have actually talked to, them, to the ministers responsible because that actually sits under Bayes. And I know that, in fact, 
the um, uh, Foreign Defense, Foreign Select Committee is also doing an inquiry at the moment into what more we can do to make sure that we don't lose out on the critical minerals issue. So it's a major foreign policy issue. The UK can try to convene more to make sure that we have a strong response, because I think that one of the figures that is bandied about, and it's probably true, is that I think it's over 90 percent of lithium mm. is uh, processed in China. And we, we have been slow. We have been slow with you know managing to access it. We've been slow to process it. And we need to do more to make sure that the West isn't left out and you don't have you know cars from Denver being actually being made in China. But of course, that is part of the part of the issue, part of the rationale for the era, the Inflation Reduction Act. So it, it's become a major foreign policy issue. Yeah. I would say one thing to add is that the U.S. Department of Energy is doing a great job on um, recovery, recovery and recycling. Yes. So, um, yeah. So uh, Deputy Secretary Wilcox from the Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, she talked she, in the in the their their latest vision, which was just launched in January. They they actually talk quite a bit about um, recovering the rare earths and the critical minerals from acid mine drainage yep. from the tailings. And actually, she says that they would have enough for the 2035 net zero electricity targets. So it's like pretty serious volume that they're going after in the recovery. Of course, it's an economic question because the cost of recovery is very expensive, right? But um, but it's definitely there. And then the other thing that we, two other things we have to talk about with critical minerals is recycling mm -hmm. and then material replacement. So yes. I would just say like, yes, we have all these charts and we just do the calculation and we say like, this is how much we need. And it's like seven times this mineral and four times that and three times this. But, you know, some of those things are like 100% recyclable, right? I mean, you can recycle quite a lot of stuff. It's more expensive today. But then if it's an energy security risk, there's a question right. and there's recovery too. Well, maybe continuing, uh, Melissa, on, 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 on this, um, there are concerns in the EU, for example, around protectionism, um, moving towards national interests. Um, how do you think the EU can avoid being squeezed perhaps by China and the US in the energy wars? Well, I mean, the thing is, you know, you, you worry about the EU, I worry about the developing markets. Mm. I mean, like the number one question at COP26 was like, how are we going to fund the energy transition in developing markets? And then IRA and then EU bill and then UK bill. Okay, so if there's only $100 and 100 like what money's left then? So what money is going to developing markets? So I think the EU is going to be fine because between the US and the UK and its own policies, I think that this is not our worry. Our worry is you look at the mix of who's supposed to play in energy transition. Our issue before all of this at COP26 where the developing markets and they're on a growth curve. I mean, that's the CO2 per capita in a developing market, like let's say Indonesia, which is coal is like two. The CO2 per capita in the, in the UK is five. CO2 per capita in the US is 15, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to still grow. So they're still on a growth curve. And we're trying to help and figure this out. And we are supposed to be pledging all this money. And then now all the money seems to be going to the West. So I would say the EU is, okay, maybe they're going to have a problem, but I don't really see. I mean, they just did their latest industrial strategy. I think it's going to be okay. Do, do you think it's made worse, this situation for developing countries because of the carbon border adjustment me mechanisms that the EU is talking about, that the UK is now talking about, because that's just going to be harder for developing countries. I think the carb I'm a fan of the carbon border adjustment, actually. I think that's okay. It's more the actual investment capital. To bring so if the I'm like, because the market's like you follow the money, yeah. if you're just an investor, right? And right now the IRA, to your point, I mean, we have... Um, I have clients in Asia Pacific, a lot in Asia Pacific, and actually all over developing markets looking to invest in the US. So I'm like, but well, what about your market? Yes, yes. <laughs> and but there's a lot. So so it's more like the flow. So I think the carbon adjustment border adjustments is the right thing because we want to reduce embodied carbon. We definitely have to work on those things. But you could have invested in, you know, like solar in Indonesia. Right or geothermal was brought up in a lot in a lot of places, and it's and those are still good investments. It's just which is the better one now, because there's maybe a little bit more money to be made there, right? So, so I think that's all I was saying is just now we've got these really big incentives as a private investor, and I have ten dollars. Where am I going to put my ten dollars? Maybe I would have. Maybe I was going to do, you know, five and five. Now I'm going to do eight and two. 
you know, so. And it's on carbon border, doesn't it? And it, it, the real question is, where's the revenue going to go? Because, I mean, yes. it's fine taxing the carbon as it arrives. But if, if that's just going to go into general government revenue, then that's clearly not helpful. If it's yeah. going to get reinvested yeah. back to where the carbon came from to as part of development funding to help transition yes. in the countries. That's and if, yeah. if, thing to if do. it then yeah. if it then catalyzes the countries to impose their own carbon tax, so actually they're generating the tax, not us generating the tax, then there's a virtuous circle that you can see. If the carbon border adjustment mechanism is just a hurrah, we'll take some more revenue and stick it on our own, you know, yeah. subsidy for our own renewables. Subsidy that's not cars. Well, yeah. <laughs> electric cars, whatever, that's not really very helpful in the, in, in the global scheme of things. I mean, I, I certainly think the carbon border adjustment mechanism, one of the rationale for it is certainly to encourage other markets to create their own carbon programs, right? Yeah, the ETS that's right. is in their own. But you can't, I mean, again, countries. where? I mean, you can't, you've got to be realistic about sure. where. Sure, uh, yeah. And I guess it's a process. And, and the question is, when can those countries uh, sensibly uh, develop those? Yeah. Um, maybe just looking at the IPCC uh, sixth assessment report, uh, which came out um, just recently, which calls for, of course, a 43% reduction in emissions by 2030 versus 2019. Um, and last week at the ministerial meeting in Copenhagen, we had the Danish Minister for Climate uh, talk about the COP28 that has to develop a very clear roadmap towards this. Um, Melissa, uh, how are multilateral agencies uh, such as the UN, its COP process, you know, being affected by uh, these global environmental impacts, uh, the energy crisis? Um, are they being able to maintain a focus on emissions reductions? How are they managing the geopolitical competition? I, I think I think it's been talked about in terms of like we need we need fossil as a backup more than we ever thought we would, right? So I think that's one thing that all of us learned in this last twelve months is that fossil is going to be really really important in the next ten years mm -hmm. because we don't know how to solve a lot of problems yet. Right. So we're working on how to run a net zero grid, integrate, like how is our inertia changing, moving from like heavy synchronous to lighter asynchronous distributed with lots of variable. Like these are all problems we will absolutely solve. I'm so confident. It's just that as you're trying to solve them, there's like geopolitical things happening, a whole bunch of other things happening. So having the backup of fossil is, is really important. And I think you're seeing that pivot in COP and everywhere else. Right. So that's why I don't want to give COP two hard of a time that they've moved it to the Middle East, the first COP in the Middle East. You know, what are we doing with the oil companies? Because we aren't in a situation when we can just, like the minister said, turn turn it off. We, we Not only can we not turn it off, we need them to really support net zero, to really be there. Like, even if it's like 30, 20, 10%, it becomes a more important 20%, a more important 10%, because it's really providing that backup. And let's be clear, we need the oil and gas com companies to give us CCS. We need geothermal. We need to have no methane venting because if methane is venting hydrogen, it's like mercury and Jupiter in terms of size of molecules. So if every join methane is venting, hydrogen is going to vent like no one's business, right? We're never going to be able to transport it. So we need them to solve that. So we need, we have a lot of problems and a lot of really talented people to help us solve those problems. So I think we need them at the table more than we've ever needed them. And, but we need them to support net zero at the pace that we want to do Absolutely. net zero, which is maybe the tension. And of course, you know, the oil and gas companies are the ones with the huge resources. If you think about the size of some of these institutions, they dwarf most of the developers, right? So if we're not having them at the table and working with them, and of course, Sultan Jabbar, the, the new president of the COP28, who's got a background as a founding member, uh, founding uh, CEO, of Mazda, one of the largest renewables investors, although he's also CEO uh, of Adnoc, the oil and gas company. So uh, I think that dual role in many ways, whilst initially was seen as a little bit of a, uh, a problem, uh, can be seen as actually a bit of a solution uh, in many ways. Um, Amber, I mean, how do you see the global north and global south tackling these challenges differently? We've touched upon it a little bit, um, but... Well, I mean, I think it's I think it's the um, age old problem slightly is, is 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 the North delivering what it said it would, 
And, you know, Melissa referred to the money and the money was pledged um, 100,000 a year, 2015. And then guess what? When the tally was done, it really wasn't adding up. So there is a there is a problem. And, uh, you know, the, the, the South does feel quite often that, you know, you spent all that carbon yeah. budget and now you're expecting us not to develop um, and you're not giving us the money to do so. It doesn't sound like a very equitable arrangement. So th- there is a problem, but I hope that I think having it in the Middle East is a good plan. It had to be somewhere in the South mm. in order to sort of try and corral that. But I would not be surprised if that's a bit of a bust up issue at this COP because it was postponed from last COP and uh, it definitely needs to be tackled. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, the global South, global North issue is is broader than much broader than the hundred billion. I mean, it is it's everything to do with um, the point that Melissa made about you know our per capita CO two emissions yeah. in the north being just way way higher. I mean, if you've only got to look at African countries, for example, that have huge gas resources, we're being told yeah. we don't need those gas resources. Please don't develop them. Three years ago, and then last year we're being told please develop your gas resources as fast yeah. as possible. We really need your gas resources. And then I was saying, okay, well, fine, we can do that, but then we're going to use gas as well. I think we, you know, the other thing is yeah. for the global south, transition doesn't mean necessarily renewables. It can do, but it actually means coal to gas to start with, which means hydrocarbons. Yes. And I think that, you know, we we have, and the other thing is we have to be very cognizant that, you know, again, to your point about producers, there can't be any losers here. This is, we need everyone to come along with us. And, and what's been very clear from the COPs, that are, well, and particularly in the Middle East, is that you know, these guys produce hydrocarbons. Their economies are based on hydrocarbons. You can't just ignore that fact. You can't just expect it to stop. We've got to, we've got to find a way to manage that process. And I think that, you know, um, the COP gets a really hard time, and it is unbelievably difficult to get consensus amongst 195 countries to come out with a, a, a kind of a, a package at the end. But I think they do serve a really useful purpose for being the place where we can all, everyone can get together and, and have these conversations, and we are we are become we can become aware that actually this is a global problem rather than a global north problem, which we're you know solving in the UK. Frankly, is is good because we're legally bound to do it, but actually, that's not really the, the, the problem we need to solve. And indeed, I think the hundred billion is a little bit of a token offering because I think um, Dr. Moyaldin, who was the climate champion in, in Egypt um, for the UN, talked about a two trillion required in developing countries to. Uh, help them get on target. So really, this is just a a path towards getting to net zero, but significantly more resources are required. Um, But I think one last point on this, I think that um, Indonesia did a really good job on the B20 last year, because I think there, for some of the solutions, some of the solutions that I saw would be like, you know, thousand points of light and like islands for solar, but they were using like solar battery and diesel, right? So it wasn't so strict to your point. It's like, so you can put solar in a lot of the developing markets, but if they have coal or biomass or diesel, well, okay, they're going to use solar with that, right? So I do think you have to work with what you've got. Yes, here, here. Indeed. And I think, the, actually, just come back to the UK point, I think the interesting thing that came out of the COPs, and the minister's kind of alluded to it, is, you know, the COP is really difficult because you need to get unanimity for the final communique. But actually what really has worked has been individual groups coming together on specific issues, methane yeah. emissions being one. Yeah. Yeah. But also some of the just energy transition partnerships that have come out in South Africa, yeah. Indonesia again, yeah. Vietnam, and then individual countries like the UK, like Germany, like the yeah. EU can lead on those things. And you, like the concept of the sort of climate club where you get countries from the global north cooperating with country, countries from the global south, binding them in to a value chain that creates yeah. value in their country yeah. and value for us. I mean, you yeah. come back to the point about critical um, minerals and, and supply chains. I mean, there's a classic example of where you ha- you know you can create a virtuous circle of energy security, industrial development, and hopefully a kind of net zero, ultimately a net zero outcome, and also provide the financing that yeah. is required. Now, there are ways of doing this. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that getting everyone to agree at one particular time is particularly difficult. But yeah. doing it on a kind of bilateral, multilateral, multilateral. Right, yeah, bilateral multilateral yeah. basis rather than a kind of unanimity is is, is probably the way forward. Okay, well, um, final question to the panel. Um, just very quickly then, um, what would you say is the biggest challenge uh, to the energy trilemma? 
I think it's easier to announce things than to deliver them. <laughs> <laughs> and so actually holding governments to account and giving, seeing what's working and seeing things change is what we need to really concentrate our attention on, I think. James? Um, I mean, the, the biggest issue is that we're not going to meet the targets. I mean, that's the bottom line. We're, we're, we're not going to hit, we're not going to be on track in 2030. And I think the biggest question then is, how do, how do we react to that? How do, how, how do policymakers react to that? I think that's the, the biggest question out there. And when when do we acknowledge that fact and, and agree that we're going to really do something about it? And I think it, the, the 2030 is kind of, it doesn't really matter whether it's 2030 or 2031 or 2035. We need to keep laser focused on the fact that there is an end goal. If we happen to miss 2030, you know, we st every degree, every point one of a degree, sorry, we can say is absolutely vital. So I think that's the biggest challenge is keeping everyone really focused, even if we start missing targets on the end goal. Very good. And finally, Melissa. So I'm going to get really operational. I think the electricity backbone, the grid, because it takes time mm -hmm. to your point. And I think if you have a real, like both the expansion of transmission and distribution, but also how we operate the system because we're going to move from a situation today where I think we're, you know, I guess 25% electricity to at least 50% electricity, maybe as high as 75% electricity. And we're going to have networked vehicles and buildings and our grid will be powered a lot by a lot of wind and solar. So lighter, asynchronous, variable and distributed grid, which is very different from our heavy synchronous grid that we have today. And it takes time for us to understand how to run that grid. And if we can run that grid well with digital and preventative and everything else, like, you know, predictive and the visualization that can come with that kind of a grid, then we can integrate a lot of things so much more cheaply, yeah. so much more cheaply. You know, we will be able to, you know, not have a grid that's like the tube where it's like super busy at rush hour and no one's there at 10 o'clock. Like we don't want that for our grid, right? We want a certain flow going through all the time, which is where the demand flexibility comes in and the signal. So there is a way to run this that's going to be a lot less expensive and a lot more secure. We can plan, you know, it's there's benefits to being able to island off sections from a resiliency point of view. And where would you put backup and like all of these questions. So I think if we just work on that backbone, I think a lot of things come. And I do think we can hit 2030. If we have a good backbone, we would be able to hit 2030. Yeah, yeah. The question is whether the <laughs> backbone would come by 2030. But if we did, you know. The UK <laughs> might. The UK might. Yeah, the world. Just the UK. About the world. Yeah, yeah, for sure, not that's the world. I'm only talking about, about the UK. I'm talking about the UK. Very optimistic <laughs> from the UK, at least. Uh, let's leave it there with the panel. Do we have time for some questions or not? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take a question from the audience. I'll take this one here. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, question about information. Um, because um, if you look back, uh, Michael Liebreich, who you probably all know, used to do this wonderful PowerPoint presentation every year about how all the scenarios were wrong. Um, and uh, particularly around, you know, the deployment and the expense of renewables and so on and so forth um there's also I, I guess linked to that a question around you know uh, part of this which is around greenwashing uh which is i think you know it's fair to say becoming more of an issue um and amber just picking up the point that you uh raised around onshore wind i'm not actually convinced the polls have moved that much mm. um in that in, in so many years we had a poll uh 10 years ago that showed about two-thirds of the public were up for it uh, is a poll but it also showed that only 5% of the public thought that it was that popular. There was complete misconception among the, pub the public about how, how popular the technology was. If we're gonna get this right, um, information and understanding of actually what's going on, to me, feels like it's gonna be absolutely critical. How do we have a common sense, evidence-based debate about all of this um, so that we're dealing with reality and uh, not something else? Is that addressed to anyone? Uh, the panel. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, we rely we rely on journalists a bit. We rely on people, other people, to get the information out to do to tell us what actually is going on. Because, like any, you know, big political issue, people take sides and they dig in and they make their points again and again. I think it's, I mean, of course, it's desirable, but there's always going to be 
you know, lies, dams, lies, and statistics, and then fake news. It's nothing, there's nothing new in, in terms of that. And, and your point about, um, you know, all, all uh, projections are fake, are not fake, and uh, turn out to be wrong, like with from Michael Libra. And yet you want accurate information. So, I mean, we, you could, not sure you have both those things. <laughs> you know, there's always going to be a difficulty. But I do think that something has changed comparing um, Paris in 2015, which I was at, and Glasgow last year is that the public are much, much more interested. You may be right on, on shore wind, who knows, but certainly the public, not just in the UK, but the wider public, are engaged in a way they've never been before. Right. And that is, I think, partially because they can see climate change, they can see the floods, they can see the fires, they can see the uh, impact happening every year. So I think we've got a much more engaged public if we can get the information to them. Um. Yeah, I think the problem is it's it's really difficult question. It's really, really difficult. I mean, sorting this stuff out is really difficult. It's so having an engaged conversation, even around prices, I mean, you know, we're going to go through a period of price volatility, but at the end of the day, the average price for consumers over a 15 or 20 year period will definitely come down without any doubt. Yeah. But we are going to go through periods of volatility. We're going to have to deal with them. And but that's a really difficult thing for a politician to have to tell um, a voting public. So I think, unfortunately, um, you know, but to your point about greenwashing, I think um, the other thing we need to do is to force companies to account very transparently for what they are doing. And methane emissions is one very good example yeah. of that, where the measurement, reporting and verification is at the moment is just woefully inadequate. And until you get governments or regions like the EU forcing companies to either disclose what's happening or best effectively fining them or charging them a penal tax on that emit on the on, a, on an assumed emissions you're not going to get a reaction so I think the accounting of companies as well and what they are doing and what the emissions really are is going to be absolutely critical too. Um, I think we have to rely a lot on the popular media and journalists because you know we need we need all of the the average person. We need everybody pulling for net zero, not against an individual group. So we need like the direction of travel to be towards net zero and clarifying and explaining. So like, for example, like the largest lithium mine in the US received LPO funding, which was amazing in Nevada, but then it just got protested. They don't want to mine in Nevada. And it's like, but don't we want electrification? Like it was environmentalists protesting the, mine, the yes. lithium mine, which is supposed to power our gigafactories, right? And so- what would have been amazing instead of just like putting fire to fuel that fire it would have been like we need sustainable mining we need esg mining we want the lowest cost like couldn't we get meet like the media to help us with the conversation so that it's not just like so fuel to the fire of who's fighting but like explain what the right this question should have been what the right challenge should have been instead of just like magnifying the complaints, because we don't really have time to complain. We have so much to do and everybody just needs to kind of move forward. Like sometimes I'll write things and I mean, okay, they're too technical, lots of words that no one understands. And then they'll say, could you simplify it? And I was like, I actually cannot simplify it. So can you just have a go at what you think it says? And then I will correct you in terms of, and that was actually the Rusi article that we just published. I was like, I don't think I can edit it. Like you have to tell me what you don't understand. And then I will then, you know, so I think there's also a gap between folks like us who've been in the industry for 30 years. And then the average person who's just trying to understand it now. And I think the media and the journalists have to play that role. But I mean, to, to, to answer your point about the lithium mine, I mean, that's the other problem. A lot of this stuff is, there's no, there's no, there isn't a, a kind of silver bullet. Yeah. One of the reasons why processing is dominated by China is because they've been prepared to put up with, with, mm. the, with the unpleasant yes. environment around a processing plant, and we haven't. And as soon as we try and bring processing into the global north, we're going to hit that problem. Yes. And so then we're going to have, as politicians are going to, and the public at large, are going to have to decide whether we want to be, you know, whether we want to outsource the processing to countries that we can forget about, but we can just get the goods, or whether we are genuinely prepared to put up with certain things for energy security. And that is a very difficult conversation to have. Mm. Very good. Well, let's um, uh, bring it to a close there. Uh, thanks to the audience online. Thanks to the audience here. Uh, and please give a round of applause to our, our panel.